Europe's human geography. Right now we'll be covering the population for part one and then we will go into part two, which will actually cover the economy of Europe. Let's go. Okay, so when we start talking about the, the population characteristics of Europe, that will be the first concept that we'll cover today. A um, couple things I want you to, to realize. One is that Europe, even though it's a very small continent as way of continents go, but it is the third most populous continent. So what that means is that even though it's the second smallest continent, um, as far as size, it is the third most um populous continent as far as population count the population of europe now this is not including russia is right at 581.5 million so it's about 581.5 million give or take a couple of million but overall and we'll discuss this later but it's something that we've already discussed before um in some of the previous in some of the previous videos that europe like most western countries the population is pretty stagnant now, the largest country in Europe is Germany, and it's right at 82.6 million people are in Germany. Now, when we say the largest country, of course, we mean uh, we mean by population count, not by land size. And the smallest country in Europe is the Vatican City. It's right at a thousand people. And the thing is about the Vatican City, it's located right in here in Rome. Um, the Vatican City is, of course... That is the headquarters or where the offices or the primary headquarters of the, of the Catholic Church. It is where the Pope lives. And the Vatican City is actually a part of the city of Rome. However, it is its own country for the same reason that Washington, D.C. in the United States is not actually a state. This reason is a district and not a state. And that is because um, by being its own by the Vatican City being its own country and Washington, D.C. being its own territory or state, um, they are not tied in to one state, right? So um, they're not tied in to one state or country when we look at the, the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church, the headquarters of the Catholic Church is its own country. And that, in, in theory, enables it not to be uh, favor to show favoritism to any one country or overly influenced by the event of one country, the same thing with Washington DC in the United States. And this arrow just shows you where uh, Vatican City is, shows you where Rome is in the map. It's in Italy. And the next graphic, what that is, is just actually showing you um, what the Vatican City is. Once again, it's some of the oldest churches that we have in Europe, definitely some of the oldest Christian churches in Europe. Um, it is the headquarters of the Catholic Church, and it's been that way in that area, probably right around Definitely since the Great Schism. So we're looking at over a thousand years. The next concept we'll cover with Europe are um, is the population density and distribution of Europe. There are a couple of key concepts I want to take a look at. And of course, you guys recognize this. This is this illustration is of, of a population density map. So the first concept I want to touch base is with you. Of course, um, Europe has the second largest population density. It is second only to Asia, um, but the population is not evenly distributed. And that's something that we could have kind of figured out ourselves. Not that the population is not evenly distributed, but that Europe has a very high population density because as I mentioned in the previous, um, earlier in the video, that Europe has the third largest population of any of the continents, but it is the second smallest. So what that tells us is we have a lot of people, relatively speaking, living in a small area, relatively speaking, which accounts for us having a high population density. Now, and once again, these are all concepts that are familiar to, um, to us. And that is that the areas that are most populated in Europe, um, these areas have similar characteristics. Favorable clients, low flat lands, um, fertile soil, so people can grow, so it's easy to grow crops and sustain life. Mineral resources, so that you're able to trade. So we mean things like not just um, gold and silver, but also for energy uses. And inland waterways, which just means that they're waterways um, that people can that are easily accessible by rivers, seas, and oceans for the purposes of, of trade and transportation. 
Now we'll review some of the most densely populated areas in Europe first, and we'll not take a look at it by country, but just really by region. So we'll take a look at it as the continent as a whole. And the United Kingdom, um, extending from France and across the Northern European plain into the Czech Republic and Poland. So we mean this area right in here and a little bit in here where the black circle is. Um, that is one of the most densely populated areas in Europe. And it makes up the United Kingdom, France, the Czech Republic, um, some of Poland. And southern France, extending into northern Italy, is another very densely populated area in Europe. And once again, this circle, uh, the bottom black circle, just encompasses that entire region. This is south of the Alps, so, or right around the Alps region, northern France. South France, Northern Italy. The next concept we'll discuss when it comes to the human geography of Europe is urbanization. And urbanization is a, is a concept that we've gone over quite a few times and let's apply it to Europe. And of course, what urbanization is, is the changing of um, the growth of cities or the rapid changing the growth of cities, also dealing with rural areas turning into urban areas so we have places small small towns becoming large cities and the process of that occurring is urbanization so what the first graphic is i like to explain to you what, the, what it is is of course this is supposed to be representative of farm areas or rural areas or places that do not have a lot of people and that is of course the first concept in urbanization is that you go with areas that are not a lot of people or a very that are not well developed and they become huge metropolitan centers and so the industrial revolution of the late 1700s transferred uh, transformed Europe from a rural agricultural society to an urban industrial society the second graphic what it does is illustrates um, what what this is a picture of an industrial revolution factory and we'll get into we've already spoken about the working conditions in those factories but once again I just want you to take a look and just notice or just realize recognize that this is what factories look like during that time um, during this time rural villagers and farmers moved to urban areas so they moved from the countryside or from rural areas and to the city or to urban areas and became factory workers what this event is referred to as urbanization, which is the concentration of populations in towns and cities and touching bases on urbanization or elaborating a little bit more on urbanization in Europe. Uh, urbanization began in Western Europe in the late 1700s and spread to Eastern Europe after World War II. So what we see is that, and I want you guys to kind of take note of this, okay? Urbanization began in Western Europe in the late 1700s and spread to Eastern Europe after World War II. There is about a 250-year um, gap between the late 1700s and World War II. Let's go with about, nah, nah, it's a little harsh, about 100, 100 to 50 to maybe 200-year gap between the late 1700s in World War II. So what that tells us is that Western Europe was urbanized long before um, Eastern Europe is. And today, about 75% of Europeans live in cities. That is, uh, so that's about average, uh, that is about what you would expect in a Western, in um, a first world or a Western continent, much like we have here in North America and Canada. Paris and London are the world's largest urban areas so Paris and London which are in Great Britain and in France respectively are the two world's largest um, urban areas and other major metropolitan areas in Europe are of course Rome Italy Rome is in Italy uh, Madrid Spain uh, Berlin Germany Stockholm Sweden Budapest Hungary Athens Greece and Kiev in the Ukraine so these are all areas once again major metropolitan centers and some of some of the other major metropolitan centers in Europe if you guys think about <laughs> um, if you think about like if you watch Born Identity or any sky um, spy movies or anything like that that occur in Europe you'll see a lot of these places so it seems like you cannot film a, a spy movie or like Taken 2 a lot of these occur in Europe so once again some of the major population 
areas, urban areas in um, Europe are uh, Rome, Italy, Madrid, Spain, uh, Spain, Berlin, Germany, Stockholm, Sweden, Budapest, Hungary, Athens, Greece, and the Kiev, the Ukraine. And of course, this graphic um, is the illustration of the Eiffel Tower. Um, it's one of the most famous monuments in the world, one of the most famous landmarks in the world. It is in Paris, and this is the Eiffel Tower at night. The next concept we will touch on in that um, with Europe deals with immigration and immigration. So when we just start discussing the immigration, which is people leaving Europe, okay, during the 1800s and the early 1900s saw a mass exodus. Uh, many Europeans migrated to North America, South America, and parts of Africa and the Pacific region. And so just kind of touching bases here in the United States, this is when you start seeing large, um, you started seeing a large influx of Italians, um, Spanish, and Jewish people in major metropolitan centers in, the, centers in the United States at that time. A little in New Orleans, but mostly New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, um, a little, so mostly on the East Coast, when you see though, that is what we experience here in the United States. A lot of those people settled there. And this first arrow is pointing to the Statue of Liberty. This graphic, of course, is in New York Harbor. This is a picture of, um, of an aerial view of New York Harbor. And this first arrow is of the Statue of Liberty. And just talking about immigration, a lot of those people who came to the United States, the majority of them, they came by boat. They came in through New York Harbor. And the first thing that they saw was the Statue of Liberty, which of course, which which of course was a gift to the United States um, from France. And the second thing that they saw was on the island <laughs> immediately behind the Statue of Liberty, which is Ellis Island, which is what the second arrow is pointing at. This is where um, the the first processing station where new immigrants came in. You came in and you know they got your name and. They, they took care of everything that you had to do first to becoming a new citizen. So the Statue of Liberty, first thing most new immigrants saw of the United States is they were coming into the port. And then you have Ellis Island, which was the processing center to make sure people were immunized. Um, they took care of immunization. They took care of the records, all those things that go um, become a part of when you go from one country to another. Now, since the mid-1900s, few Europeans have left the region. Uh, but large numbers of foreigners have migrated to Europe, which brings us to our second concept, which is immigration to Europe. And this map actually illustrate the point of this map or was to actually show you guys where the majority of immigrants from the past, let's say 50 to 60 years are coming to from Europe. And you'll see the red, the red circle a lot from northern Africa and the Middle East. And one thing we know is, um, or not one thing we may not know, but Europe is very similar to the United States in the fact that um, they have more atheists than we do. But definitely um, Christianity is a, is a very prominent religion there. The dominant religion for a lot of the people who are immigrating to Europe are Islam. So that's been, that set, that has set the stage for, um, some interesting situations in Europe, to say the least. Now, Western Europe's economy started booming in the 1950s and 60s, and this kind of this set the stage for immigration. So, which meant that we had labor shortages, and what that meant when you say you have a labor shortage, that means that you have uh, more jobs available than you have people who can fill those jobs. So, in order to have people fill the jobs, um, so European countries started inviting foreign workers to come in from North Africa. Uh, to come in from the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa to fill those jobs, South Asia to come in and fill those jobs. Now, and this worked well for about 10 to 15 years. But by the time the European economy started slowing, and by the 1970s, many of these people, many of these workers who had been there 15, 20 years as guest workers, many of these immigrants had been in Europe as guest workers, um, had moved their families to Europe, and they had established lives in Europe. So... What we started to seeing is that we went from a time when there was more money or there are more jobs for people um, to a point where Europe's economy slowed down 
And so they started being went from a time where there was enough money for everyone for everyone and everyone is happy to in the late 1970s and 80s, even going up until some today. There's not enough money for everyone. So there are not enough jobs. So you are starting to see tensions rise um, between people who are recently immigrated to Europe and people and local residents or people who were born in Europe. Um, and the, what the problem are is that these people are now because there is a scarcity, there is not. The economy is not booming. You now see people competing for jobs, housing, social services, a lot of similar to the ways um, that you will hear people in that similar to what you find in parts of the United States that deal with immigration. Most Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, those places along the, the border of Mexico, very similar themes to what we see occurring in Europe. Now, the European governments have attempted to limit immigration while protecting the rights of immigrants in their communities. And this last concept or this last graphic that we'll take a look at is just to illustrate the concept or just to illustrate that um, Europe is, has, they're in a, p a period of zero population growth or even negative population growth just like most Western or first world countries. So let's take a look at this population population grid see what we have and what it shows what i want you guys to take a look at are the top and the bottom okay so this is in 1970 um the average population the population in europe at that time was 203 million the average age was 27 um i actually it was 27.9 i do not think this is of europe but i think it's probably of a, of a of a few western countries because the population is a little larger than that anyway it still illustrates the point. The point is this. A lot of people, the people at the top are smaller at the than the people at the bottom, the majority of the population at this point in time, young people. 20 years later, those young people have now grown and the majority of the people are here and they have not reproduced as much. So now we have um, these people who are at this point in time in the 1990s or in their mid-20s to late 40s early 50s they're in a time where they should be raising families having kids they didn't have as many kids so there's not as many people being born as people here um, as we have the oldest part of our population which brings us to today where you see a situation in europe very similar to what you have in the united states is that um, the majority of the pop the oldest part the largest part of the population is the part of the population that is from uh, 65 from 45 to 65 if you take a look at the bottom uh, there are many more people from ages 45 to 65 than there are younger people entering the workforce so this is what you're saying we start seeing europe with zero population growth right now or even a negative population growth europe just like the united states if it was not for immigration would be experiencing negative population growth now despite growing immigrant populations and abundant resources um, Europe's overall population is shrinking due to low birth rates. And this is something that occurs quite frequently with Western or industrialized nations. Once um, countries generally become more wealthy, they, people generally, for any number of sociological reasons, um, generally have less kids. Okay, so two things you need to remember. Highlight the answers to your homework learning targets in your notes guide. And also answer the questions in bold lettering. Have a good day.